thank you all for coming. This is really quite exciting, actually. It's, I'm pleased to hear that you want to hear what I have to say this afternoon. Well, these are the headlines that most of us are familiar with. England is the divorce haven of Europe. Some say the world, some say Europe. Now, this may or may not be true. But it, indeed, even if it is, I wonder whether it's such a bad thing. Because the way these headlines are displayed makes it seem as though this is an evil road that London or England is treading upon. What I'm interested in, therefore, is not so much whether or not this is objectively true, but what I'm interested in is, if it is true, why? What are the reasons for it? Now, before I talk about the so-called big money cases, and believe it or not, that is the actual legal term. We call them the big money cases. Before I talk about these big money cases, I just want to put this talk into a little bit of perspective. Research in the UK and internationally is consistent that men's household income increases by about 23% on divorce, once we control for household size, whereas women's household income falls by about 31%. There's a partial recovery for women, but that recovery is driven by repartnering. And the average effect of repartnering is to restore income to its pre-divorce levels after about nine years. Those who don't repartner tend to be older women or women who have children. And for them, the long-term economic consequences of divorce are serious. In the longer term, given the need of carers who are usually wives on divorce and the children in their care for housing, for some security and income in the years immediately following the divorce, there's a trend towards them offsetting any claim for future pension entitlement against having the home now and some income now. And indeed, lack of pension provision is one of the main causes of poverty for women in later life. Divorced women are hit particularly hard. 43% of older divorced women live in poverty, and this is directly related to the breadwinner part-time worker norm, which means poor pension accumulation during marriage because women tend to rely on the breadwinner's pension. On divorce, they have too little time to catch up. So women suffer poverty in later life disproportionately to men. Why? What's going on apart from this? Pension sharing, pension attachment orders, which the court does have the jurisdiction to order, are made in only 7.9% of divorce cases. And these are usually only in cases involving wealthy parties. What else is going on? According to the Equality and Human Rights Commission, most people now do hold so-called modern, contemporary, egalitarian attitudes towards their family and their work responsibilities. But the arrangements they tend to put in place for work and child care are often constrained along traditional lines. Over three quarters of mothers state that in day-to-day -day life, they have the primary responsibility for children. And there are significant differences, not only in the actual care and time put in, but also in the perceptions of men and women about whether they share responsibility for child care equally. A third of men believe they do share it equally, but only 14% of women agree. Responsibility for housework separate from child care also hasn't changed in accordance with new, modern, egalitarian ideas of family living. Full-time working mothers do twice the number of hours of housework per week as their full-time working partners. Where women do earn, they're faced with a continued gender pay gap. The gender pay gap is lowest for the under 30s. It rises as people get older. It's influenced by these factors, low pay in sectors where women tend to work or to choose careers, and that whole ideology of choice is the subject of a whole nother lecture. It's also caused by the effect of career breaks, 
limited opportunities and part-time work. And it's there even for the most highly qualified and well-educated women. So in the context then of what our family and work lives actually turn out to be, these norms by which many still live, and in the context of what many have also called the feminization of poverty, particularly but not solely as a result of divorce, it probably won't be surprising to learn that about in about 70% of all divorce cases, the claimants for financial relief are wives. But in most divorce cases in England and Wales, we're not talking about big money. In most cases, the courts are struggling to deal with how to share the income derived from usually a one and one half earner model across two households. The big money cases that I'm going to be talking about are truly, truly the tip of the iceberg. This is that 1% that the people over at St. Paul's Cathedral very often are talking about. Not only are they the tip of the iceberg in terms of the vast amounts of wealth we're also talking about, they're the tip of the iceberg of those divorce cases in the UK because very few of these divorces get to court. Those that do get to court, of those very few are appealed to the Court of Appeal, and of those very few, even fewer, get to the Supreme Court. So the cases that are developing the principles that I'm going to be talking about are a tiny minority of cases. Yet these are the ones that make the headlines for obvious reasons, I suppose, because they're talking about amounts of money that most of us probably can only fantasize about. But because of the doctrine of precedent, that is the idea that lower courts and solicitors' negotiations are bound by the principles that come from the higher courts, these are the cases that make those principles. These are the cases in which the statute is interpreted and the principles developed. Okay, so given that context, what I want to do is look at a few of the big money cases, think about what the principles were, how they've changed, and where we may be now. So what are the principles? Well, the statute that governs is called the Matrimonial Causes Act, and I won't bore you with the details of the sections of the Act, except to tell you that it contains no overriding objective for the court to consider when it's deciding whether or not to divide the property, how to divide the property, whether or not to order that one partner, usually the husband, pay support to the other partner, usually, but not always, the wife, right? So the court has jurisdiction to make all these kinds of orders, but the statute doesn't give the court any particular objective to strive for. It doesn't give the court any guidelines to follow. All it does is say that the court has discretion to make whatever order it wants to make, taking into account a number of factors. With the exception of the welfare of any children of the marriage, the list of factors that follows is not in any order of priority. It's just here are the factors the court should think about. Now, I'll just run through them quickly, but as you can see, they're, they're sensible factors. The income, the property, what the people have, their needs, their obligations their standard of living, their age, whether they have any physical or mental disabilities, the contributions which each of them has made to the welfare of the family, conduct, if it's inequitable, to not or to disregard the conduct. Okay, so this is the context. Broad discretion of the courts taking into account this list of factors, no one factor given priority over any other factor. So how was this discretion exercised in the big money cases? I'll talk about a particular big money case, which I think is a good illustration of the principles in the 1990s. It's a case called Dart and Dart. The parties in Dart and Dart had been married for 15 years. They'd lived in England for two years, having moved from the US as tax exiles. Mr. Dart, or the family, but Mr. Dart was worth at the time of the divorce, anywhere between 400 million, which was his estimate, and 800 million, which was her estimate. 
I have to tell you that we never did find out exactly how much Mr. Dart was worth. The trial judge awarded Mrs. Dart, the claimant, among other things, a lump sum in the amount of nine million, based upon the principles that were in play at the time. Now I grant you, it's hard to feel sorry for Mrs. Dart. She got nine million, and I think I could probably live very nicely on nine million. But in the context of his wealth, which was either 400 or 800 million, this meant Mrs. Dart got anywhere between, what, one and two percent of the family wealth. The principle on which she got that was the principle that said there, were, there should be a ceiling on the award to the wife based upon her spending needs. So what the court would do, would it would give her a capital amount using actuarial type calculations to determine how long she was likely to live and give her a capital amount to meet her needs, which would reduce the amount so that it would be gone by the time she died. Based on this, court figured she needed nine million. She appealed, and she appealed saying that in these cases, the courts are giving undue weight to the consideration of needs over all the other factors that the court's supposed to take into account. Now, just as a small aside, in the Dart and Dart case, Mrs. Dart had brought an application before the actual trial decision was rendered that the matter be heard in the Michigan courts because there was a less discretionary property regime in the missionary courts. Mr. Dart strenuously opposed that application. And in fact, he won. And that's why the application was heard in England. As Lord Justice Thorpe said in the Court of Appeal, it's plain that Mrs. Dart thought she'd do better in Michigan, while Mr. Dart thought he'd do better in London. Okay, let's think about this when we think about divorce capital of the world for whom and when. I'll come back to that in a moment. OK, let's go back to the Court of Appeal judgment now. Because the Court of Appeal upheld the trial judge's award of $9 million. And Lord Justice Thorpe said, no, 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 we're not really interpreting needs or giving too much weight to needs. What we're doing is we're not considering her needs. We're considering her reasonable requirements. And reasonable requirements mean something different from needs. In fact, reasonable requirements do take into account all of these factors. And therefore, we're not necessarily giving undue weight to one over the other. So by the end of the 1990s, then, this was a case in 1997, 96, 97, somewhere around the end of the 1990s, we have the reasonable requirements principle acting as a ceiling on any award that a claimant could have in these big money cases. According to one commentator at the time, in case legal advisors have been advising their clients that if they actually make contributions to the accumulation of the family fortune, it might make a difference. No, have a look at another case decided at that time, a case called Gojkovic against Gojkovic. In that case, the court did find that the wife contributed 50%, but she was still awarded 27% of the assets. The commentator goes on to tell us that at a recent meeting of the International Bar Association Family Law Committee on multi-million dollar divorces, the conclusion was that the award to the wife in nearly 30 different jurisdictions around the world would be from 10 to 50 percent, but in the UK it would be 0.6 percent. Okay, this is the law and this is the situation until October 2000. Now, it's difficult to overestimate the revolution that the case called White and White had in English family law. In this case, White and White, a wife had farmed with her husband together two farms over the course of their 22-year marriage. She was also primary homemaker and child carer during this time, but that's to be expected and so wasn't taken into account in the decision. She claimed on their divorce 50% of the value of these two farms. Despite her claim, the lower court was bound by the reasonable requirements principle. So on the basis of that principle, 
the court determined that her desire to keep farming was unreasonable. He didn't want to break up the existing, far the existing farming practice, and he awarded her about 20% of the total value of the assets. She appeals to the Court of Appeal, still seeking 50% based on the fact that, in, certainly in part, this was a joint partnership farming enterprise, not only because she's entitled to more by way of divorce settlement. The Court of Appeal increased her award to 1.9 or 1.69 million, about 40% of the total value of the assets. She appeals to the House of Lords, which is what the Supreme Court was called at the time, still seeking that 50%. He appeals as well, saying, no, 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 the Court of Appeal was wrong. Go back to the trial court decision. And it's what the House of Lords did in this case that was the seismic shift in the law. The House of Lords confirmed her 40%, her 1.69 million. But the result isn't as important as the language they used, the principles they developed, and the discourse through which they developed them. They changed the narrative of responsibility for financial dependence and interdependence during marriage and divorce. First of all, Lord Nichols said in the House of Lords, well, there is an objective. We may not be able to see it in the statute, but the underlying objective for we courts, for us judges, to find in these cases is fairness. It's lovely. Fairness. That's the underlying objective. Fairness is to be determined according to judicial discretion. But fairness, he said, is like beauty. It lies in the eye of the beholder. He said generally accepted standards of fairness change from time to time, from place to place. What we have to do is determine what it means at any given time and in any given context. The law, he said, is a living thing, moving with the times. It's not a creature of moribund or dead ways of thought. So what's fair? In white and white, what's fair? The first thing he did was he ended the reign of the reasonable requirements ceiling. I can see nothing, he says, either in the statutory provisions or in the underlying objective of fairness to lead me to suppose that the available assets of the respondent become immaterial once a wife's needs are satisfied. Why ever should they? If a husband and wife, by their joint efforts over many years, his directly in the business, hers indirectly at home, have built up a valuable business from scratch, why should she be confined to the court's assessment of her reasonable requirements and he left with everything else? Or to put the question differently, he said, and I'll tell you what he said in a minute, where the assets exceed the financial needs of both parties, why should the surplus belong solely to the husband? Reasonable requirements is gone. But what's to replace it? Some idea of fairness. It's in the eye of the beholder. He gave us some idea of what we're going to replace it with. These are the values of non-discrimination and equality. These are the ideas that most seem to believe contemporary marriage is all about. He says, in seeking to achieve a fair outcome, there is no place for discrimination between husband and wife and their respective roles. Whatever the division of labor they've chosen or was forced upon them, fairness requires that it should not prejudice or advantage either of them. If, in their different spheres, each contributed equally to the family, it doesn't matter who contributed the money and who contributed the child care and the homemaking work. There should be no bias in favor of the money earner against the homemaker. Now, taken together, these two changes have significant implications. First of all, they mean that it's no longer fair for an earning spouse merely to meet his non-earning spouse's needs out of his capital or salary, and then keep everything else that's left over. Wives are no longer, in other words, to be financially disadvantaged on divorce for doing what was expected of them in the marriage. Lord Nichols' words are also a challenge to the traditional idea that only work done or money earned in the public sphere 
that is, by means of traditionally husband-type conduct, is valuable, either to the welfare of the family or to the welfare of society. And that work done in the private sphere, that is, that sphere of usually wifely conduct, is not valuable. Lord Nichols challenges the idea here that only the person who earns or buys is the rightful owner of family property, and that the other spouse is seeking something to which she's not morally entitled. Finally, the House of Lords introduced what can now be called an additional factor in fairness, and that is the yardstick of equality. Now, they were clear they didn't want to establish a presumption of 50-50 split. There's no presumption of 50-50 of equality in English law. There's a yardstick of equality. A judge would always be well advised to check his views against the yardstick of equality. As a general guide, we should only depart from it if there's good reason. And if you do, he says to other judges, tell us why you want to depart from it. What are the reasons? OK. This is changed the game completely, changed the rules of the game completely. At the same time as it broke new ground, we can see that white and white broke established norms. It upset them. Many people commented after this case that it increased uncertainty in the law. It encouraged litigation. Reasonable requirements, they said, was at least certain. How are we going to measure the value of homemaking against the value of an asset? So White opened up new areas for argument. It actually raised as many questions as it answered. And in 2006, the House of Lords heard another ancillary relief case, a couple of cases called Miller and Miller and McFarlane and McFarlane, where they clarified what fairness might mean in these cases. Now, I'm going to skip over Miller, McFarlane, because I don't have time and because it's rather complicated. But what I want to do now is go straight to the last of the three leading cases to interpret fairness. And it's the one which generated the most headlines. At the time, the Sharman and Sharman case, or the Sharman Award, represented the largest payout, as they call it, division of marital assets, perhaps we might call it, in English legal history. Sharman's was a 28-year marriage. There were two children of the marriage. Both were adults at the time of the divorce. When the parties married, neither of them had significant assets. Both of them were working. The wife quit her employment with local government when the first child was born in 1982. The husband's career prospered enormously. By the time of the divorce, the party's wealth amounted to 131 million, of which 8 million was in her name and 123 million in his name. She had no income at the time of the divorce. She sat as a magistrate. The husband's income was $2 million a year, roughly. The trial judge awarded the wife an additional $40 million in addition to the eight that she had, giving her 48 out of the $131 million. I calculate that to be about 37% of the total marital assets. He appealed to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal turned down his appeal based on these new white and white principles. But you know, it seemed to be unhappy about having to do this. In the rarely used form of a postscript to its judgment, the Court of Appeal called for a review of the law in the light of this revolution caused by white partly on the basis that London had now become the divorce capital of the world for aspiring wives. So those headlines that I showed you at the beginning weren't just newspapers selling copy. This call was made by the Court of Appeal itself. The Court of Appeal seemed to like the old reasonable requirements principle. It said that the reasonable requirements principle had brought about predictability and clarity. It satisfied the anxiety of judges and others, then we shouldn't be drawn into the extravagance of the awards that were made in places like California. The judicial preference for moderation 
ruled essentially for a generation, from the mid-1970s to the year 2000. It suited, the Court of Appeal said, the society of its day. However, the Court of Appeal also said, things may have changed now. So while reasonable requirements suited the society of its day, yeah, perhaps things did need to change. But did white and white make the kind of change we needed? That's where it wasn't so sure. White and white, it said, deprived practitioners and judges of the old measure of reasonable requirements. It offered us the cross-check of equality, but it didn't take into account the extent to which both the volume of these big money cases was increasing. Very large fortunes are now being made very quickly by a lot of people. And in this new context, white and white has more than doubled the awards that most claimant wives were able to get. And it has been said by many that London has now become the divorce capital of the world for aspiring wives. Now, this postscript is interesting. First, it seems to me that before white, London was arguably the divorce capital of the world for wealthy divorcing husbands. But there didn't seem to be a whole lot of outcry about that. We weren't going to be drawn into the extravagance of other jurisdictions like California in this old state of affairs. Well, this is where we are then. Now, there have been a large number of cases decided since Charmin and Charmin. The principles are all sort of being sorted out. And if there are any lawyers, some students in the audience, you'll know that those principles are still being worked out. But basically, this is where we are now. And while I think I may agree with the Court of Appeal that some reform might be necessary, I'm not sure it's because awards now, in my mind, are fairer to wives. As my colleague Jonathan Herring wonders why London being perceived as the divorce capital of the world for its increased recognition of the value of childcare and the need to combat gender discrimination is necessarily a bad thing. If our law is more progressive on these matters than other jurisdictions, it seems to me we should celebrate and not complain. Should I, I have more, but I think that might be an appropriate place to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alison. I think we've got time for a few questions. We have one here. There's a mic coming. There's a mic you. coming down. Thank you. Um, you say London divorce capital of the world, but you didn't say anything about how it would take jurisdiction on particular cases. Can you? You can't. That? Well, I, I didn't because it's it's complicated issues of domicile and residence law. Um, conflict of laws. Suffice it to say that you can't just pop into London if you happen to be a national or resident in another country and ask the English courts to hear your divorce. You need to have some connection with this jurisdiction. Okay, and that connection is by way of, of domicile or residence requirements. So the parties, for example, the darts, had sufficient connection in both Michigan, <coughs> pardon me, and London and, the, and England. It's England and Wales. <coughs> Excuse me. Freshers flu. Um, and so that's why they were able to have the, the dispute about which jurisdiction was more appropriate. And does it make any difference under what law the marriage was originally No. Contracted? No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, yeah. Would this harm anybody if it was 50 50 to start with? Well, actually, I think not. <laughs> in my view, I think not. To start with a presumption of 50-50, a presumption that might be able to be departed from should somebody require more. The argument that's usually used against 50-50 has very little to do with the big money cases. The argument against 50-50 is when you've got your basic middle class working people, 50-50 would be unfair to the carer who still has children still has the financial responsibility and the caring responsibility, perhaps can't work full time because she, usually it's she, has care of the children. So that's why they say 50-50 would be unfair to her. She needs more than 50%. And that's true. 
she does. But it seems to me that a presumption of 50-50 with a ability of the court to depart from that where need showed might be the appropriate way to go. That may be where we're heading, even for the big money cases now. The more recent cases say we should perhaps think about starting from that and then see where needs go. The point, the, the point is the uncertainty. If you know that it's 50-50 and you're a big boy and you're a big woman, you know exactly what it's going to be mm -hmm. at the end of the day. All you do is both uh, employ the private agents to make quite sure that you know what the other party's earning mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm a Absolutely. I was a divorce lawyer for quite some time. Absolutely. So you know what you, you know how this has shaken up everything. But not at this level. I'm yeah. No. <laughs> I think there's probably what ten divorce lawyers in the entire jurisdiction that deal with all these cases or something. We have uh, another question here. Well, it's coming. Um, I was just wondering, in the examples that you gave, was there any disagreement over custody? No. It seems the same logic could be applied in reverse, the preference, the mother, in terms of custody. In most of these cases, well, in McFarland and McFarland, the children, there were still children who were under the age of majority. But in Sharman, the children were, were grown up. In White and White, the children were grown up. So it wasn't a matter of anybody having financial responsibility for the children post-divorce. In McFarland and McFarland, which was an interesting case because they both, they met in university, neither one had much. Um, he, she became a solicitor, I think at Freshfield, some, one of the solicitor's firms. He became an accountant. Um, they had three children. She quit her job in order to raise the children. He went on to earn pots and pots and pots of money. The issue with respect to who was going to continue to be primary care of the children post-divorce wasn't a dispute at all. It was agreed that she would. And the youngest at the time of their divorce was only nine years old, so she had a number of years of full-time child care to look forward to. But in most of these cases, we're talking about parties who are older and the children are grown up.